I've titled this lesson, Man's Will and God's Will. One of the recurring themes, I guess you'd call it in Scripture, is just that. Man goes about trying to decide what he's going to do. And we find out that man's will is full of whimsy. And he cannot count on his plans coming to fulfillment because he's not in charge. God's will, on the other hand, is fixed. It's divine. And it's righteous. And man is unable to derail it. And that's what we've been seeing, and that's what we'll continue to see in this passage. So that's just one aspect of it that I want to point out. The first verse, verse 41. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father at hand then I will kill my brother Jacob. Wow. You ever had a brother like that? Esau, if you remember back, Yahweh came to Rebecca when she was pregnant and she was told there are two nations in your belly. And of these two sons, the younger will serve, or the older rather would serve the younger. And Esau was the older, the firstborn. And he was taken advantage of a few times, and he got bitter. And we see him now. He's in his 40s, and he's going to kill his brother because his brother took his firstborn blessing. So he continues in character. He's jealous of others. This is natural man, jealous of others and vengeful towards those who do him wrong. He held a grudge against Jacob. He hated him wanted to murder him. This is the evil heart that Jesus warned about in Matthew 5, where he said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever's murders will be in judgment of danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, we can all imagine we have cause to want to murder somebody. Esau, he thought he had cause, but did he? From the very beginning, God had instructed mankind, you do not take the life of another. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. The state is given. Even back in the day before Israel was formed as a nation, individuals were not given authority from God to take vengeance on another human being and take their life. Human life different than animal life. Man can't just decide, I'm going to kill you. We have to guard ourselves against the bitterness evident by Esau's own thoughts because that's what the Lord examines. Man can see actions, but what we see recorded here, what Moses records here is what Esau thought thought. Look at the text again. Esau hated this and he said in his heart, okay, God knows the heart of all men. Isaac had blessed Jacob by the ruse of Rebekah and he had always been fond of Esau and he wanted to bless Esau and he intended to bless him because he was the oldest and he was Isaac's favorite. But his wife wouldn't have this. As Michael pointed out last week, these people were doing what they desired to do, yet it was the Lord's will that what was being done. The older would serve the younger, despite what Isaac wanted. The younger would be blessed as the leader of the clan. This is the revealed will of God and we see it unfolding throughout Scripture and in our passage today. Man will be used to fulfill God's will, whether he is willing, whether he is unaware, or whether he is outright opposed to the revealed will of God. In Isaac's family, we see that each person has departed from the revealed will of God in one way or the other. Isaac wants Esau to be blessed 
But God has revealed that the younger would be blessed. Rebecca goes against her husband and deceives him, so he'll bless the one that God wants to have blessings given to. And an Esau commits murder in his heart. And Isaac, or rather Jacob, goes along with his mama's malicious deceptions, all in the context of God orchestrating the outcome. So let's look at the next few verses, 42 through 46. The words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away until your brother's anger turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him, then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be, re why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like those who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Wow. Now, it's interesting. Esau said in his heart, and then the words of Esau were reported to Rebekah. So Esau thought it, and then maybe he went on muttering to himself, or maybe talking to some of the other lower lifes in the clan, and they heard it and they reported it back to Rebekah. At any rate, the cat's out of the bag. Now, Rebecca's favorite is Jacob. And so she goes to him. See, Rebecca's not permitted, as a woman in this day, she's not permitted to join male conversations at will. She just can't insert herself even into her husband's conversation, unbidden. So she's got to rely on secondhand information or subterfuge in each of these events we've heard about. The, each of these events where Rebecca has done something, words came to her. She, she went and found out. She overheard. Her information wasn't wrong, but it was gathered in secret. She didn't want to be discovered. She's not content for her husband to lead the clan and his family. She and he have different favorite sons, and each of them seeks to prosper his or her favorite. She told Jacob, your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. How quaint. Can you, can you fathom having a son who's consoling himself by thinking of murdering his brother? Pretty brutal consolation. Esau sees comfort or consolation in killing his brother because he feels betrayed. He feels like he's been wronged and murder is the appropriate response. This is the depraved human heart exposed. Man in his natural state sees himself as the rule for what's right and wrong. Violate my rule, I get to do you wrong. God's word puts limits on that, repudiates it as wrong. Note also the lack of intent or action to restrain Esau. There's, there's nothing in this passage that says that Rebekah tried to reason with Esau or have him restrained physically. Just tells her, her, her favorite son, run away. This failure to even attempt to restrain sinful behavior within the family is sin itself. In the, in the New Covenant, uh, fathers are supposed to bring their children up in the fear and nurture of the Lord. Elders are supposed to manage their household well so that their children don't bring a reproach on the name of the Lord. You remember from 
1 Samuel 3, a few generations after this, the Lord came to Samuel. Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all that I've spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I've told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity, iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Pretty stern stuff in the old covenant. But this also reflects on why elders are held to that standard of ruling his own house well and having his children in submission with all reverence. You can't just sit back and let young kids, especially unregenerate young kids, but all young kids have their way. There has to be boundaries established. This is why every parent must honor the Lord by seeking to restrain the sin in his children and teach them the ways of truth. When, when our kids were little, I was not a Christian and I was negligent. I was derelict in this regard. It's not the way to go. If you are in Christ and you have kids in your home, it's your obligation to teach them the ways of God. So Sarah, or Rebecca rather, she sends her son Jacob to her kinfolk for safety. She's bitter over the Hittite wives that Esau had previously taken. Look back in chapter 26, verses 34 and 35. Um, when Esau was 40 years old, he took his wives, Judith, the daughter of Beeri the Hittite, and Basamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they were a grief to the mind of Isaac and Rebekah. So Rebekah's reflecting on this and she's heaping up anxiety on herself, imagining the trouble she would experience if Jacob was to marry a Hittite woman as Esau had done. This worked its way into Rebekah's mind as she pressed Jacob to follow the guidance of Abraham regarding choosing a wife for Isaac. You remember that when Isaac was of age, Abraham sent his most trusted steward back to Abraham's kinfolk to bring a wife for Isaac, and that's where Rebekah was found. God led that man to the water trough, and Rebekah was brought as a wife for Isaac. And so Rebekah, she remembers God did this once. He had this instruction. We need to go back to our own clan to get a wife for my favorite son. He, he, she calls him her son. And she calls Esau your son. Her main goal motivating her to do this is not the welfare of her son, but her own sense of peace and sanity. If Jacob married a Hittite, Rebekah says, my life would be over. What use is my life? What, what good will my life be to me? See this? What good will my life be to me? You, you get married. You join a covenant community of believers. Your life is not to serve yourself. But our lives are to serve one another. Rebecca, she's self-focused here. That, that's, that's what's driving everything she does. What, what's good for me? It's the common pit for humanity, looking inward to determine the course of action rather than looking to God. See, God's ways alone are untainted by sinful emotion. God has emotions, but everything about him is pure and infinite. See, God calls himself a jealous God. He can be jealous without being sinful. When you and I are jealous, it's because we're self-absorbed and we're tainted by sin. God's self-absorbed because he's all glorious and has no darkness in him. There's nothing better than him. Ron Crisp observed, Isaac rebelled against God and saw his plans come to naught. 
I like that word. His favorite son went bad, and his home was filled with strife. Esau lost the blessing and his soul. He was a man who loved neither God nor his people. His murderous intent toward Jacob was a manifestation of his character. That pretty much sums up Esau. One, one commentator observed, reflecting back on Rebekah's devious plan in chapter 27 to steal the blessing from Esau. He says that the Bible paints a picture of a troubled family. Rebecca was using her son, not their son, to destroy her husband's plan. And Jacob agreeing to lie to his father and cheat his brother again. A curse of an unexpected sort was the result for Jacob and Rebecca. Their scheme forced Jacob to leave his father and mother. And the Bible gives no indication that Rebecca ever saw her favorite son again. So she did everything for herself and the son that she cherished, she sent away so he'd be protected and come back in a few days. No record that she ever saw him again. Is that better for her soul, do you reckon, than what if he had stayed and married a Hittite woman? We don't know. She sent him away. Good for him to marry somebody from his, from his parents' clan. That's the plan. Never sees him again. Genesis uh, 27, 5 and 6. Uh, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to bring it. And Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I will make your father speak to Esau, your brother, say, Bring me game, and so forth. His, her son... See what he, she says there? Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son. This attitude amongst parents is regrettable. It's damaging to family. You may have a favorite child, but you've got to stifle that and not let it come out in your speech. You must teach yourself that all your children are made in the image of God as human beings, and you are to love each one of them and not let yourself fall into this human, humanistic pit of treating one better than the other. You have to treat them different because they're different, but you don't treat one better than the other. So let's look at uh, the next bit. We get into chapter 28 now, verses 1 through 5. Isaac blesses Jacob. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padam Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there, from the daughters of Laban, your, father, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, in which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Paddan Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebecca, Rebecca, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Apparently Isaac, Michael mentioned this last week, maybe Isaac had a conversion experience in last week's passage. We see here that Jacob is given a blessing by Isaac and Isaac's eyes are open. He knows who he's blessing. And note what he does. He passes on the blessing that he was given that was first given to Abraham. And so we have the patriarchs of the faith set up here now with virtually the same promise. But note also the urgency of the command. Do not take a Canaanite woman, but at once go to Rebekah's clan to find a wife. Maybe Isaac and Rebecca had a little household conversation before this took place. You know, maybe they both came to understand, yeah, this, this is kind of what we see working out with Abraham, and this is what we need to do with our son Jacob, so let's be together on this. So maybe they've come together now. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt. It is contrary 
to the lack of cooperation and the outright malicious manipulation that we have been seeing in this family, however. But perhaps they're together now. Rebecca's brother Laban was specifically mentioned for Jacob to seek out. We all know the story of how Laban deceived Jacob into taking his firstborn daughter Leah when Jacob wanted the second-born daughter Rachel. Okay. You might say what goes around comes around. It's interesting to me, though, that he was deceived eh, differently than how he deceived his dad. But it's also that <laughs> the firstborn of Rebecca didn't get the blessing, but the firstborn of her brother gets the husband. The secondborn, who he wanted, is not the one that he gets at first. So firstborn children always come into play one way or the other. Because you, you go read that story, Laban says it's not right for the secondborn child, uh, daughter, to get married before the first one. That's why I gave you Leah. So he's defending his culture. He, but that's not our story for today. Now, Isaac had already given Jacob the firstborn blessing. That's what happened when Rebekah and Jacob deceived him. And in this passage, when I was researching it, about him giving this blessing from Abraham, basically, I discovered that Jewish theologians consider Jacob to be the firstborn. On one website, I found this. The Midrash relates that Jacob was actually created from the first drop of semen while Esau was created from the second, similar to two spheres in a tube in which the one inserted last exits first. So Esau exited Re Rebekah's womb first and Jacob exited second. From this perspective, Jacob was essentially the firstborn. That is why he tried to delay his brother's birth so that he would be born first just as he was created first. Now, see, right there at the end, he betrays his lack of understanding of basic biology. Firstborn means come out. Right? The first one that comes out of the mother's womb. Different from created first. Yet they conflate the two because what? They are focused on first birth. And so they redefine it and they confuse it and they re reassign first birth to the one who was conceived first, so they think. See, when you got customs that you try to overlay on God's revealed will, you're going to get confused in your own head. We just need to submit to what God has revealed. Every translation I found reports that the first baby that came out was ruddy and hairy, and they called him Esau. After this, it says in Scripture, Jacob's hand was seen grabbing his heel. Another article on that same Jewish website, study website, agrees with Scripture that Esau was the firstborn. The site... Kabad.org. It's a good example of having traditions that contradict Scripture. And isn't this what Jesus rebuked the Jewish leaders for in His day? You have by your traditions made the Word of God of no effect. We have to guard ourselves that we don't get caught up in that trap. Because people who do these things undermine the authority of Scripture. And they set up themselves as a judge of what is right and what is honorable. And doesn't that get back to the temptation in the garden? God knows that in the day that you eat, your eyes will be opened and you will know good and evil being able to discern that. It's a serious temptation for us in our daily walk. And we, like I said a minute ago, we have to guard ourselves against it. Now, Isaac is apparently resigned to submit his will to God's. And he passes on the blessing of God given, into, given to Abraham and himself to the next father of the nation that Yahweh was forming up. I previously showed you the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are nearly identical. I'm going to go over that again briefly. 
in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in three different chapters, nations would be blessed through them. And in three more chapters, now that was chapter 12, 26, and 28, and in chapters 15, 26, and 28, descendants would be as the stars of the sky. For Jacob, it's as the dust of the earth. It's still hard to count, but you got those two things. In chapters 12, 26, and 28, the promise was to his seed. The seed would be blessed. Alone to Abraham in Genesis 17, he's said to be the father of many nations. So that one thing about Abraham's promise is different. The rest of them, very, very similar. And this continued promise was evidence of God's faithfulness and provided hope to his people. We're going to hear in the next hour about hope that we have because we are God's people. Well, even in the old days, before the new covenant, before the spirit of God was given to us to indwell us, he gave hope to his people and given this promise to these people that he called out of the masses of humanity that Abraham belonged to way back in chapter 12. This is something that his people can hang on to. God's promise, because unlike you and me, his promises cannot be broken. Now the seed would be blessed. Isaac's seed would be blessed. Jacob's seed would be blessed. Abraham's promise was to his seed. And as Paul pointed out, his seed was singular seed, who is Christ. That's the promise to whom the seed was made. Oh, that's the seed to whom the promise was made, excuse me. Next week, Aaron's going to show who the author truly is. They, Isaac's not truly the author of this promise that he gave to Jacob. And we'll see next week who it comes from. Note this, God discriminates. He chooses who he's going to bless and who he's not going to bless. The promised seed came through Seth, not Cain, Shem, not Ham, Abraham, Isaac, not Ishmael, Jacob, not Esau. Each one of these were God's choice, and oftentimes they confounded both the demon world and the offspring that were there, the human offspring. Our confidence in God is in realizing that he is Lord of all and that there is none like him. See, when, when God's working stuff out in our lives and it's not going as we had planned, we need to sit back and reflect on what motivated our plan. And it's obvious now that something different has happened, maybe a trial, but it's better for us than what we had planned to do. Because that oft-repeated verse we have in Romans 8, 28 is true. He does work all things together for our good, those of us who are called according to his purpose. So we have to trust his hand of providence, even as our plans are being wrecked. Now, as I mentioned before, and as Michael mentioned last week, it appears that Isaac had a conversion experience during this episode last week, and it appears his will is now aligned with God's will, not his own will. This is a key. Natural man lives according to his own will. That's how Jacob had, or Isaac rather, had been living for a while. Now his will is lined up with God's. This is a good indicator. Isaac tells Jacob to go to his mother's people for a wife, the same people that Rebekah told Jacob to run to. And again, this is reminiscent of how Isaac's wife was found. But this would not work out its way in Jacob's life as it worked out for Isaac. The last passage in our text is verses 6 through 9. Esau responds. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and had sent him away to Padamaram to take himself a wife from there. 
and that as he had blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padamaram. And so Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalath, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebuchadnezzar, to be his wife in addition to the wives that he had. Now, Jacob's listening to his parents now. It, they're in agreement. They're not fighting each other in their counsel. So he did like Jacob did. He went to Padam Aram to find a wife. He went to where his mother's clans was. Esau is not stupid. He knew that his mother was grieved over his Hittite wives. He saw that it was not good in his father's eyes for him to take another wife among those people. So he went to where the other son was sent. So he pays attention and he follows Isaac's counsel to Jacob and he takes his third wife from the clan of Ishmael. Yeah, he went close, but he didn't get the home base. He went to Ishmael, not to Abraham. Now, Ishmael is Esau's spiritual father. Ishmael represents those who take up their hand against the people of God. That's Esau's place. Esau wanted to please his mother and father, but it appears he had no concern to please the God of his father. So instead of looking to Abraham's people who were following God, he looks to Abraham's offspring that were not following God. Even so, taking a wife from Ishmael's clan was not the same as taking a wife from Abraham's brother, Nahor, his clan, from which Rebekah came. So he got close, but he didn't get to home base. So if you're a religious person and you're trying to do good, you can get close, but you can never satisfy God working on your own terms. What can we conclude from all of this? This is no surprise. Here's the conclusion. God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can cooperate with God or we can kick against the goads. Either way, His will be done. Numbers 23, verse 19, you know the story of Balaam. And he wants he's hired by Balak to curse Israel. And God appears to him a few times and finally convinces him, you will not curse Israel. You will only say what I tell you to say. And in verse 19, he tells Balak, God is not man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will not he do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? See, God alone can say and do, and nobody can turn him back. How futile it is for us to fight against providence. Griffin Thomas offers some insight. He says, one, God has a plan for every life. God had a plan for Jacob's life, and that plan could not be hindered by the action of Isaac or Esau, nor could it really be furthered by the cleverness or craft of Rebekah. It gives dignity, force, and peace of life to realize that God has a plan for it, and it is at once our duty and privilege to seek out that plan and to, to discover God's will concerning us. Number two, God has his own ways of realizing his plan for us. Rebecca's thought in sending out Isaac was very different from God's idea. There were surprises in store that Jacob never dreamt of. God's ways are higher than ours, and it is our truest wisdom to let God show us his way 
and enable us to fulfill his purpose concerning us. Providence is, as always, in view when you're reading the Bible, especially the narrative accounts, things that did happen in history that were guided by God's hand. And our passage shows us consequences for disobedience even when God's people are being used to accomplish His will. The Jonah ran from God. Hate them people from Nineveh. Don't want to go preach repentance to them. You don't know what you're thinking, God. That, that's basically Jonah's attitude, right? What does God do? Let him go and pick another? No! He could not escape God's call in his life. Jonah, your charge is to go to Nineveh and preach to them repentance. Peter denied the Lord three times. He was not abandoned by the Lord who loved him. He was not abandoned by the Lord who prayed for him. See, our disobedience doesn't overthrow God's plan. It reveals to us how much he doesn't need us, but will not leave us to ourselves, even limiting the actions of many who are not his children. You recall when the second time Abraham surrendered his wife Sarah as his sister because he feared for his own life, and Abimelech, the king of Philistine, took her and was planning to make her one of his wives, and God came to him in a dream and stopped him. He, God says, I stopped you from sinning against me. Why? Because Sarah was important to his plan. What he was going to do through Sarah and Abraham was important to his plan. A puny little king, not going to stop him. God doesn't always reveal his will for you and me. There are some who, they'll quote a verse, say God does nothing without revealing it first to his prophets. Context will interpret that for you. There are things that God has in store for us that he doesn't reveal to us. You got God's revealed will, you'll find it in here, and you got God's hidden will, and you won't find it. As with Jacob's son Joseph, who would find out after many trials and uncertain circumstances that Yahweh was guiding all the events in order to save the people he had chosen to be his covenant people. He didn't know that when his brothers threw him in the pit. He didn't know that when he was in jail. He discovered that after all things had been revealed through circumstances. Favor would follow Jacob as he followed God's revealed will. This is the way. Walk in it. Find God's will for you in the Bible and follow that. And see, God doesn't tell us specifically who to marry, what job to have, where you're going to live. He does give us guidance in each of these areas, and he gives us wisdom to those who humbly seek it from him so we are equipped to walk in his will. Now, this is, you know how you married the right person. You know how you married the right gal, right, Mike? Because you got this thing on your finger that says you swore to God in a covenant. This is my beloved. And nothing but death is going to separate us. That's the right woman for you. Took place a long time ago. She's still the right woman for you. That's the way we know God's will is being worked out in our lives. And as many areas of our lives, he does provide clear instructions that we would do well to obey. We tend to skim over what he has told us so we can worry about what he hasn't. 1 Thessalonians 5. Joan pointed this out to me years ago, before I was even in Christ. She says, you want to know God's will for you? Here. 1 Thessalonians 5. She's probably going to say, I don't remember doing that. We have those moments too. Um, Verses 12, starting in 12. Where is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 12 through 22. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, Comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, 
but always pursue what is good both for yourself and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecy. Test all things. Hold what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. No, wonder no more what God's will for you is. Don't worry about what he hasn't revealed. It's unprofitable to worry about what he hasn't revealed. So we mine the scriptures to discover his revealed will, and we do it. And we should not fret about what we do not know, because he knows his hidden will, even if we don't. John Flavel reminds us, if we were to understand how dear we are to God, our relation to him, our value in his eyes, and how he protects by his faithful promises and gracious presence, we would not tremble at every appearance of danger. To those who are in Christ, the love of God assures us that we are secure. And this is the perfect love which casts out, which casts out fear, fear of death, fear of the unknown, fear of abandonment. The fear of God should be present in us is not the same fear of God that those who are not in Christ should have. See, if you're in Christ, your fear of God will keep you humble before him and people. If you're not in Christ, your fear of God will terrify you if you rightly understand who he is and what will happen on that great and terrible day when he returns. We have a sense of awe and reverence that rightly understands best man can that the infinite has made peace with the finite. If you are in Christ, this verse from a well-known hymn should comfort you, it should soothe your soul. What e'er my God ordains is right, he never will deceive me. He leads me by the proper path. I know that he will not leave me. I take content what he has sent. My, his hand can turn my griefs away, and patiently I wait his day. See, if, if you're in Christ, his sovereignty should be a great comfort to your soul. Because what can man do other than kill your body? God's refuge is secure. But if you're not in Christ, you don't have that comfort. But there's another verse from another hymn that ought to be information for you. All things are ready, come. All barriers are removed. And God in Christ, his precious love to fallen man has proved. He has done everything and there is nothing that should keep you, nothing that can keep you from crying out to him for repentance. 1 John 4, 9 says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. The will of man and the will of God, it's not a contest, but it's a contrast. Even the Son of Man prayed that his human will not be done, but that his Father's divine will be done. In salvation, the sinner's will submits to the will of God. Man cannot add to his height or to his years. God creates from nothing and gives life to that which was dead. He does whatever he pleases and no one can stay his hand. Is he calling you? If he is, do not harden your heart as in the days of the wilderness, but come to him. All barriers are removed. All things are ready. Come. All who are weak and weary, come to Jesus. He saves sinners. That's why he came. Let's pray.